Good morning, calculus students. Good afternoon. Um, today we are going to continue to look at limits and we've looked at graphs, we've looked at tables. Now we're going to talk about the algebra. Today is the nitty gritty of how do you solve these limits algebraically without the use of a calculator, without graphing them, without crazy decimals for those tables. So we need to discuss a few properties first. Properties of limits. The limit of a constant is just that original constant. The limit of a monomial, um, a one term, would be that term times whatever constant is the front. The limit of a sum or difference, you're allowed to find the limit of each term individually and then add or subtract them. The limit of a product, same thing with multiplication, you can find the limit of each term individually and then multiply the results. Division is the same thing provided, provided you're not dividing by zero. That gets into a few other situations that we'll talk about today. And the limit of a power or a root, you can actually find the limit of the outside and then find the root or the power of that afterwards. So I've got eight examples for us to jump into. Some of you who are those algebra fans that really like to just dive in and solve problems, jump in, dive in to solve problems, you will appreciate these. It steps away from that um, abstract piece of some of those limits by graphing and limits by table by tables, you'll be happier with some of these. So for example one, I have x squared minus 4x plus 6. That's a parabola. I know it's a parabola. The x squared term is positive. I know it opens up. You just want to think about these functions a little bit as we go through them. I want to know what's happening as x approaches negative 1. I don't have to graph this in my calculator. I don't have to do anything else with it. But if x is negative 1 and the answer to a limit problem is the output or the y value, what do we do with negative 1? You substitute it in. So this would really be negative 1 squared minus 4 times negative 1 plus 6. So here's a 1 plus 4 plus 6. This is 11. And it is that easy. I don't have any tricks for you on that one. It is that straightforward. So example two, the limit as x approaches five of four x minus six, that constant there is in the front. You can leave it just like this. You can say four, put in the five for the x, substitute five minus six. So this is four times negative one. Four times negative one is negative four. That's your answer, totally fine. Um, it might be helpful sometimes to pull that four to the front. It just depends on the problem. The limit as x approaches five, of x minus 6. So same thing. You can put the 5 in. So this is 5 minus 6. So 4 times negative 1 is negative 4. Totally fine. It just depends on what the situation um, would handle best. For example 3, you're going to substitute that 1 in for each x. So this is 1 squared minus 2 times 1 to the 25th power. So 1 minus 2 to the 25th power. So negative 1 to the 25th power. So you have to ask yourself, is this going to be a positive 1 or a negative 1? Well, if the power is odd, think of negative 1 cubed. Negative 1, negative 1, negative 1. Your answer is a negative 1. If it were an even power, it would be a positive 1. So this results in negative 1. Again, what's happening there is you can, if I refer back to this rule, this one right here, you find the limit of the inside and then you take the power. So you could say that this is the limit as x approaches 1 of x squared minus 2x, the whole thing raised to the 25th power, take that power on the outside. So this is 1 squared minus 2 times 1. So this becomes, same thing, 1 minus 2 is a negative 1, oops the 25th power, which is negative 1. And then example 4, the limit as x approaches 0 of 5 minus x over 2x plus 3. Again, you want to substitute that 0 and see what you get. So in the numerator, I have a 5. In the denominator, I have a 2 times 0 plus 3. So this is 5 minus 0, we should say. So the top is 5. The denominator is 3. The answer is 5 thirds. And again, what's really happening is this is the limit as x approaches 0 of 5 minus x over the limit as x approaches 0 of 2x plus 3. 
you can find the limit of the numerator and denominator. So in the top, we have a five. In the bottom, we have a three. So there's our five thirds. Excellent. All right. But what if it doesn't work? And this is where limit problems start to get interesting. This is where we have to do real math and real calculus. Sometimes it will take algebraic manipulation to get your answer. Look to see if you can simplify or factor and then simplify the rest of the problem. So there's a couple options here um, and I just want to list them out for you. So factoring is a big one. I'm going to say that's like 80% of the problems we run across. Um, so we can factor. The other thing that you can do is, and it depends on the problem, you can multiply by a conjugate. And that might be appropriate if you have a square root. We'll have to go back and see if we have any of those, those examples. Um, I don't think I have any trig examples today, but sometimes you can simplify the trig. And any other legally algebraic appropriate method you can apply to your problem, you're welcome to do because you want to solve these algebraically. So example five, and we've actually run into some of these very similar already um, with the discontinuity problems. We would say that this is discontinuous at four because we're attempting to divide by zero. And then you could factor the top and you would cancel out those X minus fours and you'd figure out it's a removable discontinuity. This function looks like a line, but it's got a removable discontinuity. It's got a hole in the graph at four. So algebraically, what's going on with that? We are going to say that the limit as X approaches four of X squared minus 16 over X minus four. The first thing you do with any limit problem is substitute the value. You want to see what you get. You can't make any assumptions. So if I put four in the numerator, this is four squared minus 16 over four minus four. So the numerator is zero, the denominator is zero. You want to be careful with your equal signs. And I've been doing some reading about this on various message boards. You don't really want to say that these are equal. And the reason is, especially with zero over zero, zero over zero is not a number. So you can't be equal to zero over zero. So arrows are a little bit more acceptable, but they're still kind of shady. Um, you could lose a point on the AP exam if you say equal zero over zero. So arrows are a little bit better, but still you want to be careful of it. But nonetheless, we figure out that we have zero over zero. This is my clue. This is my message that I have to go back and simplify. So that's exactly what I'll do. And in the same step, I'm going to write it as a numerator and denominator. So the limit as x approaches 4 of x plus 4, x minus 4, all over the limit as x approaches 4 of x minus 4. Uh, do I want to do it that way? Yeah, we can. If you have the x minus 4 in the numerator and denominator, just like we did in those other problems, you can cancel them. Actually, you know what? I'm kind of thinking on the fly here. I'm a step ahead of myself. Get rid of this in here. Keep this over x minus 4 for now. Just do the factoring. There we go. We'll write it separately in the second step, in the next step. If I have x minus 4 in the numerator and denominator, those cancel just like you did. You actually learned this early in, or somewhere in Algebra 1 with rational functions, and I know you did more of it in Algebra 2. So you are left with the limit as x approaches 4 of x plus 4. And now your job is to just solve this problem. So you take the 4 that x approaches this one, and you substitute it into x, so your answer is 8. This equal sign would be okay. That would be okay. For example six, kind of the same idea, you always, always, always have to start with that zero, or excuse me, put in the three to see if you get that zero over zero. So this is three squared minus four times three plus three over three squared plus three minus 12. So let's see, I've got a nine minus 12 plus three over a nine plus three minus 12. Those are looking very similar. That's a negative three plus three, that's a zero. And that's a zero. Again, don't use equal signs. You can't equal zero over zero. 
but that is enough to tell me that it's indeterminate. And I know I've used that word a little bit already. It's indeterminate. It's not one, it's not zero, it's not infinity, it's indeterminate. But for us with limit problems, it's, hey, I can go back and simplify. So be a good algebra student here. Factor the top, the numerator factors into x minus one, x minus three. The denominator factors into, let's see, x plus four, x minus three. And again, ask yourself, is there anything that cancels out? Well, yeah, these are designed to work. So for the majority of them, there are. x minus three cancels out. So this is where I want to write it as a numerator and denominator. So the limit as x approaches three of x minus one over the limit as x approaches three of x plus four. So the limit in the numerator would be three minus one is going to be two. And in the denominator, I've got three plus four, which is seven. So my answer is two sevenths. Perfect. Now, oh, we do have trig functions. Good. I can zoom in on this. I should do that. The limit of pi over two. Now, I've had a few discussions with some of you and some email correspondence back and forth. How confident are you feeling about the unit circle? And I'm getting, eh, not a lot. I either had pre-calculus in the fall, and so it was a really long time ago, or I had pre-calculus in the spring, and we had to learn it in distance learning. So try to find some resources to brush up on your unit circle. I'll try to look around as well. But here's your unit circle. Pi over two is at the top. So this is pi over two. The coordinates up here at the top are zero, one. And if you remember from your unit circle, the x coordinate represents the uh, cosine value. I almost said that backwards. And the y coordinate represents the sine value. Now, my particular problem is about tangent and secant, so we're going to have to look at this a little bit differently, but we want to evaluate what's happening at pi over 2. So up here at pi over 2, um, your tangent comes from y over x, so it's the sine over the cosine, so it's going to be 1 over 0. Your secant is really cosine, and so you want the reciprocal, the reciprocal of cosine, so cosine value is 0, so this is 1 over 0 again. Now in limit universe, we haven't really discussed this too much. Um, one over zero or zero in the denominator, we treat as infinity. We treat that as infinity. So I have infinity over infinity. Well, what is that? I'm gonna actually scroll back up here a little bit. If it doesn't work, the two big things you're looking for, you wanna look for zero over zero then you can factor, multiply, do any of those things. The same is true for infinity over infinity. You can also go through and do any of those things. It's also indeterminate. I can't say it's one. I can't say it's infinity. I can't say it's zero. It's still indeterminate. So my strategy is to try to simplify this as much as I can. And you know from your work in pre-calculus that when you're dealing with trig functions, you want to get them back to sine and cosine if you can. Try to get them to that most base unit. So tangent, we said again, is sine over cosine. And secant is 1 over cosine. Okay, so now I have this fraction over a fraction. There's more than one way to handle this. I want to talk about two ways here. Um, a lot of you have been taught that if you divide by a fraction, it's really multiplying by the reciprocal. That's absolutely valid. So sine of x cosine of x times cosine of x over 1. What happens with those cosines? They cancel out, and you're left with sine of x. So this will simplify to sine of x. The other option, and this is a tendency of how I, this is how I tend to think of it, excuse me. Sine of x cosine of x over one over cosine of x. I multiply by a common denominator and we had to do that to simplify some other problems. So that's kind of where I go. So there's a cosine in the denominator here and a cosine in the denominator here. So in my head, I multiply by cosine x over cosine x because cosine over cosine is really just one. So I'm allowed to do that, that's valid. But in the numerator, my cosines cancel and in the denominator, the cosines cancel. 
So I am left with sine of x. So it depends on your algebra background. It depends on how that idea was introduced to you. They are both valid. They will both get you there. You just have to simplify to the sine of x. Let's go back to our problem. So this is now the limit as x approaches pi over 2 of the sine of x. Take your pi over 2, substitute it for x. The sine value on that unit circle up here is 1. So the limit is 1. Awesome. All right, one more example 8. This could be cool. The limit as x approaches 4 of root x minus 2 over x minus 4. First thing you always do with a limit problem is substitute that x approaches value. So this is 4. So this is root 4 minus 2 over 4 minus 4. This is looking like a 0 over 0. Remember, not equal signs because you can't really equal 0 over 0. But that does tell me it's indeterminate. <clears throat> Excuse me, it does tell me I have to go back and fix it. So one strategy that you had in algebra 2 to deal with radicals was to deal with the conjugate. Back in algebra 2, we told you you're not allowed to have a radical in the denominator. I'll tell you in secret in calculus, we don't really care. <coughs> Excuse me. But it is a useful skill to deal with that radical in the numerator. We don't want a radical there. So what we need to do is multiply by the conjugate pair. And the conjugate pair looks almost the same, but with an addition sign. You use this in else two again to get it out of the denominator. I don't really care about that. So in the numerator, do not FOIL. Leave them separate. Square root of x minus 2, square root of x plus 2. In the denominator, you do FOIL. <clears throat> what did I do wrong? Oh, no, I said that backwards. All right, I'm back. Um, I think I was talking about the numerator and denominator upside down. I don't know if you can see the sunrise behind me. It's a little bit early, so I'm not thinking quite straight. You FOIL wherever you have that conjugate pair match. So in this case, it is the numerator. I'm thinking of all those algebra two rules. If I have the square root of x minus two and the square root of x plus two, those are the two that, that we FOIL, that we multiply. So square root of x times square root of x is x. Square root of x times 2 is 2 root x. Negative 2 times root x is negative 2 root x. Negative 2 times 2 is negative 4. The denominator, the two sets of parentheses are different, so do not FOIL those. That's what I'm trying to say this morning. x minus 2, square root of x plus 2. There we go. Now, in the numerator, these terms cancel out. Maybe you can see where this is going. I just realized I have a typo. It happens on the whiteboard too when I'm at school. All right, where's my typo? Did you find it already? You probably did. And if we were in class, you'd say, Mrs. Charnley, we have a typo. Um, I miss you not being able to tell me that. So this x minus 4, I copied incorrectly. This should be an x minus 4. This should be an x minus 4. All right. x minus 4, there we go. That looks better. Square root of x plus 2. OK, now we're talking. So what do we have that's exactly the same in the numerator and denominator? That quantity x minus 4, those cancel out. What's in the numerator? This is usually a given for students, but every once in a while we're a little shaky. Don't forget there's still a 1 left up there. Square root of x plus 2. Put that 4 in for the x. The square root of 4 is 2. So this is 1 over 2 plus 2. This is 1 fourth. Ooh, I made that a little painful today. Um, it's not as painful as it should be, but there it is. I'm going to show you how to do this one more time. So if that makes sense to you, stop there. Go work on the practice problems. However, every year I have one or two students out of everybody who looks at it a little bit differently. So in case that's you, um, I want to show you just one other method. You can actually do this with difference of squares. I know they don't look like perfect squares, but you can kind of fake it. 
So you still get zero over zero, that's still true. So this is the limit as x approaches four. I guess I'm over all the way. You can actually factor the denominator. Um, we're used to perfect squares, but if you think of x as a perfect square, what's the square root of that? Well, it's the square root of x. So you can factor the denominator into the square root of x plus two, square root of x minus two. So what I'm doing is I'm thinking like an x squared minus uh, 25, that we factor that into x minus five, x plus five. That's kind of the same idea that I'm using in the denominator. I'm just using the square root. So in this case, the square root of x minus two, that quantity cancels out. And so you're left with the limit as x approaches four of one over root x plus two. The square root of x or the square root of four is two. So this is one over four. You get the same thing. And like I said, I only have one or two students every year that see it that way. The majority of us, because we spent so much time in algebra two on conjugates, prefer the first method and that's totally fine. So what I need you to do is work on the practice problems on solving algebraically. I'm gonna tell you right now, you're gonna have questions. Um, some situation is going to arise that I did not cover in these eight examples and that's okay. Reach out, several of you have reached out to me via email, that's great, I'm here to answer your questions. Find me via Zoom, ask Mrs. Oaks, but solving algebraically, this is what we need you to know. All right, good luck.